Rob, you also had an objection in, in a, an F-111. Can you tell us about this? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, many people that I've heard tell ejection stories, it's about their heroic efforts and, <laughs> and awesome uh, story. Mine is not that. Mine is riddled with oopses and uh, other things that, I don't know, at the time seemed humorous after the fact. Uh, but so 22 September 1993, uh, flying out of Cannon Air Force Base, New Mexico, middle of nowhere for, for that uh, base, and we were number two of a Plan 3 ship. When it comes to step time, only lead has a jet, which is pretty common for that series of aircraft. Uh, so he steps on time. I should mention, too, it's 22 September. Fiscal year ends 30 September. So in the great brainiacs of, the, of that era, um, if you had flying hours still left to fly, you had to fly out your flying hours. Because if you didn't, you might not get them the next year. You know, the same flying hours you didn't really need to fly. You might not get those same hours the next year. And there's always hiccups in a flying schedule, but we were militant, you'll pardon the expression, about flying out those hours. So uh, it's the 22nd. My 10th anniversary is two days later on the 24th. That next morning, I'm going on leave, taking my wife and three-year-old to Lubbock, the big city of Lubbock, 100 miles away for a long weekend to celebrate. And uh, like I said, number one steps. Number two, my jet comes available a fair amount after step time, and since... Number three had annual flying requirements he had to get, and my Wizzo and I, who is Greg Wilson, call sign PUD, um, did not. So we gave him our jet, or they gave him our jet. He took, he went out there, caught lead right at takeoff. They take off. Planned mission was a night low level uh, to uh, simulated attack on the low level, and then onto the range. Lead was going to leave early from the range to go fly out some other requirements. Um, Great. So we wait, wait, wait. No jet available. Maintenance canceled. Head out to our cars, but we weren't quite quick enough. If we'd have been a little quicker, I would be in much better back shape today. But anyway, um, we weren't. The soup caught up with me as I'm starting my car and said, hey, maintenance just got a jet available. You're going to fly. We're like, no, we're canceled. It's like, yeah, no, you're going to fly. And he won. <laughs> so we go back inside and we, we are no longer in any part of the mission planning. This is None of these contingencies were discussed. So the only way we can pretty much make it work by as late as we're taking off, it's a uh, southwest flow takeoff on uh, runway 22 on Cannon. That's the main runway. And the range is almost due west at about 25 nautical miles. So we're already taking off southwest. We elect to do a south entry to the range, which is something we almost never did in AVFR. So we take off, clean up the gear, just leave it in burner, get to about 0.9 Mach, and immediately start a letdown turn into the range, um, which, um, spoiler alert, turns out in the accident investigation, it's not authorized at night or IMC, that's not the truth. <laughs> so there's our first, oops. Uh, but thanks to my Wizzo, uh, Pud made it all work out, and we fell in behind number three. So it was one, three, and then us is number two, fallen in about 16 miles in trail. They were about eight miles in trail. We're 16 behind the guy in front of us. We do our first lap on the range and lead now has to take off and go do his other requirements. So it gives me the lead. Now we're basically at opposite corners on the range from our wingman, uh, number three. We come around to a south final, I think it was our third pass and let down on the terrain following radar to 400 foot set clearance plane. We're getting everything ready, switches, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, an incredibly loud bang. Air aircraft just slews to the right violently. Uh, the whole cockpit lights up. I mean, it's pitch black. There was a quarter moon that night. I don't remember that. I looked it up. It's amazing what you can find on Google. <laughs> uh, it was a quarter moon that night. I knew it was pretty dark. Uh, but all of a sudden, the cockpit's just bright as all can be. I can see everything. And uh, then the master caution light, the fire engine fire light, all the lights on the caution panel start coming on one after the other. Uh, we start doing the bull face. I start a zoom and a left-hand turn aiming towards Cannon Air Force Base. And uh, the range controller goes, lead, are you, are you throwing chaff? Which, I mean, it didn't stop our actions, but mentally there was a pause. I went, mm -hmm. how would he think chaff was lighting up the sky <laughs> from 14 miles away? Anyway, it just was one of those, what? Yeah. There'll be a few of those. Uh, anyway, uh, we start the zoom, bull face. Now, we had just taken off, and though we were in burner for a while, we may have burned most of the fuel out of the wing, 
But we took off with 34,000 pounds internal mm -hmm. fuel of F-111, a lot of gas, 27,000 of which is in the fuselage tank. So we might have burned down some of the 2,500 pounds in the tank by then, but and we would have, but uh, they may not have been empty. And as we found out, known design defect in the F-111, this happened fairly often, uh, bearing fails, blades contact the side of the engine, and they start shearing off and flying in all directions. Unfortunately for us, one of those directions was right into that fuselage tank. Oh. So now you have an engine fire being fed by 27,000 pounds of fuel. Um, so you have big fuel tank, little bitty fire bottle. Fire bottle is not going to put that fire out. <laughs> no. and it, um, so what does the bull face say after all that? If fire is confirmed to check. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm looking at a runway off my nose. I can see the runway lights. It's literally five minutes, including the letdown, and I'll be on that runway. And I'm thinking, home, air crew safe, aircraft saved. I can go on leave the next morning. I'll have a hell of a story to tell. You know, <laughs> basically the performance report and the safety thing write themselves. I mean, I'll be. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, while I'm looking at the comforting runway, my Wizzo is looking off the right side. And he can't see any of his wing, basically, because that whole side is engulfed in flame. Oh. So the if fire is confirmed, eject wasn't even a question. I mean, it was for me because I couldn't see it. He could see it, but I couldn't. Uh, so he went, dude, we're never making the runway. We got to eject. And I'm like, no. Meanwhile, we had been talking to our wingman about what was going on. So now I'm pointed, no kidding, right at the little tiny town between us and the base as I'm zooming still. I'm like, I can just picture the arc right into the middle, tiny town. It's only like five or six buildings, but I could just see that much airplane at that speed hitting the ground yeah. it would level the place. I'm like, we can't, we got to turn back south. So now I'm still turning back to the south. Um, I told the wingman, hey, we're going to have to eject. The wingman transmits back, roger that, we'll make the call. We we both could feel we kind of paused, Pud and I, for a split second, but kept going. And later on, we're talking about it. We both went, yeah, at the time, I wondered what call he was. He's going to call our wives? Who's he calling? And then we hear him go, mayday, mayday. Hey, mayday. Oh, that call, the one I was supposed to make and completely forgot. I think that's oops number two. Um, so he makes that mayday call. We're like, oh, okay. But meanwhile, we're not talking about any of this. We're just doing our procedures, getting in place. Um, we always briefed since the beginning of pilot training. Uh, the command is bailout, bailout, bailout. On the third bailout, you go. If you don't go by the third bailout, you're solo. In a VARC, that doesn't work because you both go in the cockpit. Speaking of which, so that's what the ejection handle looks like. It's tradition. They always present it to the uh, yeah. air crew when uh, when they talk about. Anyway, so I'm turning back to the south, still zooming. Now we're starting to get the uh, low speed warning because we've traded off. We started at 400 AGL. I think we punched out at like 8,000 AGL. We traded a lot of speed for a lot of altitude. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I go, all right, turn back to the south, starting to roll wings level, and I go, bait. And that's as far as I got when he pulled the handle. So. Bad on me. What do they pound in your head from day one of pilot training? Correct body position. What was I not in? Correct <laughs> body position. So I shouldn't even have started the bailout command, but to be fair, punch whole side of the aircraft's on fire. And if we stayed this with, with this much longer, who knows if the capsule would have actually ejected or if we'd have burned through stuff. So he was right to pull the handles, and we probably should have pulled it sooner. Um, you know, little town, big ground theory, probably wouldn't have hit it. But in any case, that's what happened. So he pulls the handle huge kick in the butt i mean they tell you about this but it just that's a huge rocket motor that fires yeah, that yeah. capsule because it weighs some there's some weight there and uh we launch and as soon as we launch because i'm not in body position my chin hits my chest at an instantaneous 20 g so Ooh. instantly i knew i had erred because <laughs> now i'm in just shooting pain up my upper back into my neck um wow. oh, I, it, it's like being in a traffic accident i mean it happens in a split second and we're under the chute, and Pud, go, Pud looks up, goes, hey, good chute, we're okay. And I go, no, I broke my back. He goes, we're okay. And I go, no, I broke my effing back. And he's like, oh, damn. So in a regular parachute, when you're coming down, you know it has to rotate to spill the air because it's yeah. fucked, unless you can pull the four-line jettison. There's no four-line jettison on an F-111 canopy, and it's huge. So it's spilling the air, which causes the whole thing to do this big circle. All those parachute lines shroud down to a knuckle coming out of the bottom of that knuckle. Uh, one line goes to the back rear, or the rear right corner. One goes to the left rear corner and one goes to the nose. Those three cables connect that whole thing together. Well, that knuckle pivots. 
So we're doing circles as we go in a big circle. Wow. So it's a little disorienting. There's no real horizon. There wasn't much moon. It was very quiet, though. Uh, and we're still surrounded by our home. It's all with us there as we, we come down. And trying to get into a good body position, I completely locked my harness. Everything I was, I was not. I was trying not to move. Now the impact of the capsule historically, I've seen numbers anywhere from thirty to forty-four percent of ejections resulted in spinal injury. I've already hurt my spine, so I'm thinking this is going to suck. <laughs> yeah. And since we don't really see the horizon, we don't know when it's going to happen. But we did see the air, aircraft impact the ground. A oh, did you really? Away. Oh yeah, that was impressive. Uh, it was a big explosion. I mean, it it was not much different than seeing the films from Desert Storm when explosions went off. Remember, a lot of gas yeah. coming down really fast. So eventually we hit, and that was a pretty violent impact. Our legs flew up. Shins hit the underside of the dash. We both ended up with uh, pretty good bruising there. But oddly enough, didn't re-injure or injure my back more than I had before. Pud lost his contact lenses uh, when he hit, <laughs> when we hit. And I ended up somehow with some small scrape on the back of one hand. I mean, small, like a pencil eraser. Yeah. That was it. I mean, we were both like, well, okay, well, the landing itself worked out pretty well. That body position seemed to work. Um, the accident team estimated that we bounced when we hit the first time. We bounced about 20 feet in the air and then hit the, hit the second time and stuck the landing on the second time. Wow. Um, uh, I never felt any of that. It all happened so fast. It was just violent, and we're done. The problem, so we landed, it's it's desert, it's scrub, it's sandy, but not like not like rolling sand dunes in the Sahara, but sandy. And we ended up in a depression surrounded by the tops of dunes. So um, we try to vector our wingman over us because he has the pave tag pod. And of course, he can see the wreckage easy enough, mm -hmm. but he can't see the capsule. We're not that hot anymore. And they both were staring at us. We ejected. So that bright rocket motor flash, they were night blind now. They couldn't see squad. My Wizzo is trying to vector him to us. I should add that um, after we landed, he Pud got out his flashlight. Less than a minute later, the flashlight went dead. Like, damn. So I handed him my flashlight. Less than a minute later, it went dead. We both had NICAD rechargeable batteries, which, as it turns out, Weren't authorized for aircraft aircrew for that very reason. You don't get any indication until they just go dead. And so now we have no flashlights. So mm. he's trying to get the quick reaction kit, which is the headrest of the Wizzo seat. And if I remember right, there's like two thumb screws you loosen up and then it hinges off. Pud can't see. He's lost his contact lenses. By the way, he found them the next day. They had rolled up in his head and they finally came back. Oh, down. really? <laughs> yeah. So he he just basically hulked it off that headrest. He just yanked it off and bent the metal wow. to get it off. Gets out the radio. Before he even gets out the radio, we're like, well, we have no light. We can't even see. Never mind the fact that two days later, we both realized we had lighted knee boards on our legs, which had each three or four AA batteries, which easily could have powered our flashlights or just used it. Neither of us thought of that. That's like, oops, four maybe. So he gets the, uh, I go, hey, get out the survival beacon, the white flashing beacon. Don't look at it, but turn it on and just set it behind us. So at least we're getting some light flash and we mm. might be able to see from that. So he goes, good idea. He turns it on, puts it up on top of the uh, the cockpit remains that are right behind us. And it just disappears. Because what's behind us? A great big hole that a big parachute just came out of. Mm. So it just dropped into that hole. And all you see is just a little bit of glow cresting mm. the top of that hole. Can't see anything, but damn. Gets the radio, gets the wingman on. That's when we find out he's blind. He spends, gosh, I don't know, it seemed like 20 minutes or so, trying to talk him onto us because he can see him overhead with light. his lights on. Um, it He never gets them talked onto us, really, and they had to bingo out for fuel. But at one point, Pud went, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to light off a flare. Maybe you can see that. So I'm strapped into the cockpit still, trying not to move at all because I'm pretty sure – based on previous history, I probably broke some vertebrae. And he's about to light off a flare surrounded by tumbleweed and dry brush. So as he's about to do this, I go, okay, but whatever you do, don't start an effing fire. <laughs> Just as I said that, he keyed the survival radio to talk to our wingman, and that's on guard. So I basically just broadcast on guard to the whole world to hear, whatever you do, don't start an effing fire. <laughs> 
They played that for me multiple times and had great <laughs> joy in playing. That's your voice, right? That's you who said that? Yeah. Yes, that was me. Yeah, they had a lot of fun with that. So that's, oops, five. Um, but meanwhile, we're, uh, we're relaying through them to the soft, and uh, the soft can actually hear us somewhat. And um, there's a rescue HH-60, I think it was, rescue helicopter that was flying an end of fiscal year, flying our requirement, bored out of their mind up at Albuquerque, which is about a three-hour drive away, a couple of 170 miles maybe, nautically. Anyway, they're in the area flying. They hear all this going on. They call our SOF and go, hey, do you guys want a rescue copter? And the SOF asks us, and we go, not only yes, but hell yes, because I could just imagine riding in a fire truck or an ambulance or something like that, bumpity bumpity with my back killing me till we reached somewhat of a paved surface, which would have been uh, dirt, for a few more miles to get to a paved road, then another 20 mile drive to the base, which was the closest hospital. Wow. I'm like, yeah, well, this he, he must have asked this, this question three or four times. So I don't know, I never did find out what the snafu was, but basically they eventually got him heading our way. Um, then the fire truck shows up and we're both kind of suffering shock and dying of thirst. And Putt asked the fire crew for a bottle of water. They got, well, we don't have any water. He goes, what the hell good is a fire truck without water? <laughs> and they went, well, we could see where you were. And then we go behind dunes. We'd lose you. We kept getting stuck. So we jettisoned our entire load of water. And he basically said, then why'd you keep coming? And a few minutes after he arrived, they arrived, the ambulance showed up. Um, he asked them if they had any water and they flip him a bottle of water. He drinks it and goes, Hey, can I have one for KY? They went, well, we only had one. So that was some pretty poor crew coordination right there. So he just drank it all. Um, that was, that was number six, probably. Anyway, now they're working on getting me out of there, but because of the back injury, the, they're trying to slot a backboard in their cervical collar, get me all strapped in. Now on the, uh, to get me out, they got to get the control stick out of the way. The control stick is set up to be removed. There's a like a three-inch neural nut that holds it down, and it's safety wire. So you just got to break the safety wire, unscrew that. If you land in water, you do that. You change a pin, put it back, and then that becomes a bilge pump. No mm. kidding. The capsule has a built-in bilge pump if you land yeah. in water. So it's meant to come out. And, and here's this poor med tech. He's laying <clears> on his stomach across the rail of this canopy, which is pretty sharp, digging into his gut head down at my feet, trying to work around my feet and calves, because I can't move, there's no room, with a flashlight in his teeth, trying to get this damn thing off. And he's getting more and more frustrated with it. <laughs> he finally gets it off and just goes, woof, and throws it into the darkness behind him, which will come up again in a few minutes. Um, so they get me all out of the, not strapped in, they get me out of the cockpit onto a stretcher. Meanwhile, the helicopter called in, uh, said they were en route, and remember all the trouble they had. We couldn't talk our wingmen onto seeing this. So they had, hey, uh, for vectors. And they went, no, we're 40 miles out. We got you visual. Because there's now a bunch of hot trucks around mm -hmm. us. And they could they could see it 40 miles out. Anyway, they come in, land. They put me on a stretcher. And I'm a pretty big dude. I'm probably about 200 pounds at the time, six foot one. And they put three big strapping firemen on three corners of the stretcher. And a female who was probably... A five, four, five, three, probably didn't even weigh 115 pounds on the other corner. We're walking in a desert that looks a little bit like the moon's surface. <laughs> she made it about 30 feet before she stepped in a hole, twisted her ankle, and she dropped oh. to the ground along with me. I'm like, why is this? I mean, yeah, it was her job sort of, but I mean, yeah. there were other guys around. Surely I'm a big dude that I can't believe they had her carrying. So now she gets a ride out in the helicopter as well. Because now she's got a bummed ankle. Um, so uh, they put me on the helicopter, and that helo pilot, man, my hero, you'd have never known we were in a helicopter. That was the smoothest takeoff flight over. Of course, it was only a few minutes by helo. Landing, uh, if I hadn't been looking out the window, uh, to the, it was right next to my head as I was strapped in on the stretcher, I wouldn't even know we landed. But I can see the base lights as we settled down. Met by the ambulance, taken to the hospital. Wow. Um, where they did, I don't know, 10,000 x-rays, it felt like, and oddly enough, didn't find the compression fractures in those three vertebrae. It was wow. years later after I PCS'd that uh, I went to a, so they sent me to a chiropractor, which is not a good idea with fractured vertebrae. Um, it was years later, I PCS'd, and it was a new chiropractor taking x-rays. He goes, hey, has anybody told you about your upper back? He throws the x-ray up, and I went, 
oh, damn. I mean, you could see it clear as day. Those three vertebrae yeah. were compressed in the front. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have been seeing chiropractors all this time. But, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so now starts, uh, oh, and also a shout out. My squadron commander and ops officer at the time, uh, they called our wives. And the first words out of my squadron commander's wife, uh, mouth to my wife was, just so you know, they're, they're fine and we're talking to them. But he had to eject tonight. They're out on the range. We're getting a helo to pull them out. So immediately let her know what's going on, but immediately let her know first that everything was okay. Because he knew if he just showed up at the door, the first thought Something's would be wrong. Yeah. catastrophic. Yeah. And he brought his wife over. She watched our kids who were already asleep because um, uh, we had a, a newborn as well. He was only six months old at the time as my three-year-old daughter. Uh, so she stayed there. He took her to the hospital. So they were waiting for us at the hospital when they when they brought us both in to check us out. Kept us overnight for observation. Like I said, the next morning, Pud's uh, contact lenses mysteriously showed up. Oddly enough, <laughs> at my retirement physical, uh, they called me from the VA and said, hey, um, there's a couple things you didn't have on your, you didn't report. One is you had a broken leg. And I'm like, not to the best of my knowledge. <laughs> so yeah. I think that night when my our shins hit that dash real hard, I actually might have cracked my uh, leg wow. bones all that night. But I mean, it was bruised. It hurt to walk on, but the concern was my back. So some interesting things happened during the resulting safety and accident boards. Um, the like weird questions, like uh, one of them that really stuck out was, What's your favorite beer? That just seemed really odd. And of course, they question us separately, and we're not supposed to talk to each other, which of course we do because we're crewmates. And that later that day, we were both called in that day. Both were asked that question: "What's your favorite beer?" I think at the time I, asked, I answered like, "I don't know, Michelob Ultra." Um, anyway, what why they asked was because they found a beer can near the capsule, like within 15, 20 feet of the capsule, and it wasn't aluminum. It was tin. It was rusted. It was, didn't. It was so old it didn't even come with a pull tab. It was one you had to open with a church key. Right. So I can only think they're trying to make sure that I didn't have this plan. If we ever rejected, the first thing we're to do on the way Back down the arrow. is crack a antique beer. <laughs> like I, I can see trying to close all the avenues of question, but that was yeah. really odd. Another shout out to our flight surgeon, because not only did he come that night with the med text and pull it, you know, to help us. Uh, but the next day he made a when I was released at home, he made a house call to check up on me and my Wizzo at the at our houses. He uh, he drove us out to the accident site so we could see it firsthand where the airplane impacted. Uh, it, it was basically I sent you some pictures is basically a 20 foot hole. And at yeah. the bottom of that hole, you could just see some of the tail cans sticking out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a great picture of that, but that would have been a great picture. Um, and some of the records uh, around there. And then he rented a plane and took us flying over the site and showed us the whole thing from the air, too. Wow. He, that's above and beyond. He, he was an awesome, he probably the best flight surgeon I had in my career there. He was great. Um, so also a shout out to him. Let's see, there was something. Uh, oh, one of the other things that kept coming up during the accident uh, investigation or the safety, I don't remember which, but again, was clearing up uh, loose ends was what happened in the control stick. Remember? Cause he was frustrated yeah. out in the dark. I'm like, okay, I confess I had a broken back. They're carrying me out. And when she dropped me, I thought, you know what? I'll unstrap. I'll go look for this stick in the darkness. Cause I really want this souvenir. <laughs> What are you guys thinking? I don't have a clue where that stick <laughs> went. It could be buried in a sand dune. Yeah. It could have been if it could have been carried away by somebody. It could be in a box, meaning to give to you. I, I have no idea what happened to it. Um, so about a year goes by, and I get a box, no return address. Note says, "Don't open this till you get home." Oh, nice. <laughs> so the individual said, "I saw that go flying in the darkness, and I was pretty worried." Somebody might just grab it as a souvenir, and I thought you probably deserved it as a souvenir, so I made sure you got it instead. I'm like, okay, well, thank you very much. That was very nice. That's Whoever very nice. You were, yeah. Two days later, I was returned to fly because again, they didn't find any evidence. Yeah. Back to store. Uh, the first sortie they had me schedule on was a night sortie again, <laughs> to which the ops group commander went, dude, to the squadron commander. What are you thinking? Put him on a day sortie. Let's get him back in the air. Um, and I started flying 
that month. So this was thir- Wednesday night. Monday, I was flying again. Oh, and I, one of the walk around things is you have to get up and look in the nose gear at a few things. Yeah, I couldn't turn my body like that. So I had to get on my butt on the ground and crab walk under there to look up, see what was going on there. Wow. And then crab walk back out so I could roll over to my stomach, push up to a standing position, which means I probably shouldn't have been flying. But, you know, I'm not telling a flight surgeon that. What am I, insane? So exactly, we flew. Yeah. And thankfully, nothing. We never had to. I didn't have to eject again because I probably would have been a cripple or dead if I had at that point with already the problem with my back. Yeah. Um, and my wife and I never got to go on that uh, holiday for our 10th anniversary. I mean, we still have a pretty good story to tell, but yeah, we never, never made she it. She probably just reminds you every every now and again, doesn't she? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, she doesn't really talk about it because, I mean, that night she watched the $400,000 in insurance just evaporate before her eyes when <laughs> she saw me in the stretcher. And I mean, I, t- I mentioned before we started that uh, the squatter and I was in the 522 was the fireballs. This is actually my fireballs shirt. And nice. the caterpillar pin, pin, I'm sure you've seen these before, for uh, if you have to use a parachute to get out of a injured aircraft, there's a caterpillar club for, you know, it's the silkworm that yeah. you know, they make shoots out of and stuff. So, yeah, I'm a proud member of that. So, yeah, not the heroic tale it could have been, more like a lot of whoopses. And and not only us were lucky, they said that the, uh, the capsule has like 1,800 things that happen in the yeah. ejection. All the primer cord that has to fire to separate it from the cut from the aircraft, all the widgets, they all have like tertiary and secondary backups. My capsule they said was the most successful capsule they'd ever recorded. It was only one tertiary thing that failed to fire. Everything wow. fired exactly like it was supposed to. So again, very fortunate there, because I could have been part of that hole. And uh, the poor security cops they left out at the accident site and the capsule to guard it overnight till they could get crews out the next morning. Yeah. They found the next morning after it heated up about 10 feet away from the capsule was a rattlesnake hiding uh-huh. under a bush. But of course it was a chilly night. So it was lethargic over there, not doing anything, but that poor security guard, he could have been injured too. So again, I mean, all around it was an unfortunate night, but, but we were all very fortunate the way it all worked out and uh, back to flying, never lost my ejection qual. Absolutely, I mean, what an amazing story, Rob. And I'm guessing you and Poda are probably bonded for life over that experience now. <laughs> so, like so many things with PCSing all the time, we lost touch with each other. With each other, oh. I ran into him again. He went to Strike Eagles. I stayed with the uh, F-111 till it died and went off to staff work and stuff. But uh, ran into him in Al Yadid in Gutter uh, at the at the Brit Bar actually nice uh, having a few drinks there he was deployed with the strike eagles i was there doing uh i was the deputy eight three in the staff there for uh, deployment and uh you know we reconnected but then again I lost touch over the years and they did have a lot of fun with our call signs ky pud um yeah so anyway but no i i'm not sure what happened to pud where he is today sadly wow yeah thankfully you're here safe and sound rob but uh, thank you very much for sharing that story Absolutely. Hope uh, somebody at least finds it entertaining. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, so cheers again, and thank you for coming on the show, mate. Absolutely. Wouldn't have missed it. Thanks. Thanks.